It's a real pleasure to have you all with us this evening. Uh, this is our first webinar of the Hillary term. And um, I'm delighted to tell you that we have uh, registered tonight uh, 341 uh, registrants, including Anna's mum. So hello to Anna's mum, lovely to have you with us. And we have people joining us tonight from 14 countries on four continents. That's if you count Australia as a continent. So it's wonderful to be able to uh, connect with so many members of our community all over the world this evening. Uh, and it's a particular pleasure to um, welcome Laurie McGuire uh, to give our webinar this evening. Uh, Laurie needs no introduction, I'm sure, to many of you. She's been a tutorial fellow at Magdalen for the last 21 years. She's written 10 books on Shakespeare and Renaissance literature. And for the past nine years, she has been a trustee of the Globe Theatre in London. Uh, her particular interests uh, include theatre performance and textual transmission. And that's really uh, the basis for the talk that she's going to give us this evening on Shakespeare's second thoughts. So thank you very much, Laurie, and over to you. Thank you so much, Diana. It's lovely to be here for this webinar, and it's lovely to see so many names, if not actual faces, uh, on the attendance list. Uh, let me just share my screen so that we can all look at Shakespeare's second thoughts together. And it might not have escaped your attention that we're having this webinar on the feast day of St. Agnes, um, which is January the 21st, and it's a day more typically associated with the romantic poet John Keats than it is with Shakespeare. And that's because Keats wrote a long poem called The Eve of St Agnes. Uh, in fact, I had a lovely Eve of St Agnes party on Zoom last night with my students. And I mentioned Keats in a talk about Shakespeare's second thoughts because Keats was a poet who had a lot of second thoughts and very conveniently left us manuscripts showing his revisions. So I want to begin with one stanza from his Eve of St Agnes poem. And I should just explain uh, that popular belief had it that unmarried women would dream of their future husband on St Agnes's Eve. And so in Keats's poem, Porphyro hides himself in Madeline's bedchamber, hoping that she'll sense his presence uh, and dream of him. And this is the moment when Madeline is preparing for bed. And you can see a lot of revising activity going on. Uh, Keats's first thoughts are the words that I've deleted in the body of the stanza. And the material that's highlighted in fluorescent yellow on the right of your screen shows Keats's revisions. I've tried to color code the material uh, so that we can see patterns of alteration. And in the first line then, red are the revisions that archaicize the vocabulary. Uh, they're medievalizing uh, the poem, exoticizing the atmosphere. But soon becomes anon, prayers become vespers. In the next line, the verb that I've highlighted in turquoise shows Keats making the act of unbinding her hair uh, a lot less purposeful. Uh, he's moving the action into a kind of slow motion. Uh, think of those Hollywood heroines uh, who shake their long tresses free uh, or shampoo advertisements that do the same thing. And what's interesting is that the revision freeze now accords with unclasps in the next line. I've highlighted it in turquoise, but he's not made any alterations there. Uh, he's very happy with that. He leaves it as it is, uh, but he's making line two agree with line three. Then we get a spate of words in green and they all seem to be removing explicit um, physicality. Um, as Peter Barry points out, there's a kind of slight 1960s carry-on film tint uh, attached to bursting bodices and bosoms. So what Keats does is he changes sexuality to sensuality. Uh, he literally introduces um, the senses uh, of heat so that bosom in line three becomes warmed. Um, he introduces smell Bursting in the next line uh, becomes fragrant. 
uh, and he introduces sound. Fall, falls light, becomes creeps, rustling. The change in the next line is acoustic. Um, Keats changes the regular rhythm that's at the end of the line, uh, like a siren of the sea, almost jog trot regular. And he changes it by reversing the sound, reversing the syllables. So it becomes like a mermaid in seaweed. He's slowing down the action. He's slowing down the oral experience of the poem. And he's moving us into a dreamlike state, uh, which may be why he completely rewrites the next line to accentuate the state of being half awake, half dreaming. So that what we get now is this pensive a while uh, she dreams uh, awake. Um, much more concentrated than she stands a while in dreaming thought and sees, where you've got a lot of words that aren't really doing any poetic work. Uh, they're not earning their place in the line. She stands a while and sees. Uh, all that was really um, significant in that line was the two words dreaming thought. So he extends that over the whole line. And the final substitution that I've marked and read, the very last word, takes us back to the romance atmosphere uh, of line one. So fled is, uh, is much more emotionally motivated than dead, has a nice kind of kinetic action to it. Then Keats copied it out neatly, he copied it out tidily, and it looks like this. He's got really, really nice handwriting. And as Shakespeare critic, there is never a day goes by without my wishing that we had something like this for Shakespeare, a before version and an after version, as we do of many of Keats's poems. And one of the biggest changes in Shakespeare's studies in my professional life has been the realization that Shakespeare also revised his work. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, we were still enthralled to the notion that Shakespeare was not just a genius, but a god and gods don't have second thoughts. And of course, we don't have any manuscripts of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, there's one partial exception where we've got 147 lines in a collaborative play. Uh, so we can't really see Keats, uh, can't see Shakespeare at work from start to finish in a, in a, in a work the way we can see Keats at work. Shakespeare's plays reach their original readers in printed single play editions. Uh, they were the equivalent of today's paperbacks. But within those printed texts, we can sometimes glimpse the underlying manuscript and see evidence of second thoughts. But the second thoughts don't look quite like Keats's second thoughts, and they come into different categories of revision. So I want to show you three different types. And the first is from Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet have just met at a, a ball uh, and they've fallen in love. It's almost daybreak and they're saying goodbye. And at the top of the page, and I just need to move my tiles here so I can actually um, see the, uh, the lines. And at the top of the page, you see one of the most famous farewells in English literature. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. Then we've got another couplet in which Romeo says goodbye uh, to Juliet. It ends so sweet to rest. In other words, goodbye. Um, and she obviously goes inside. She's at her window and she goes into the tiring house. There's no exit marked, but that's not unusual in Elizabethan plays. Exits are frequently missing. Actors can usually be trusted to get themselves off stage at the appropriate moment. Then Romeo has a short soliloquy, and this is what he says. Um, I've typed it out and I've modernized the spelling to make it easier to read. Sorry, that's a terrible thing to do to Claire Danes, uh, but I will, I'll bring her back shortly. So what he says is, the gray eyed morn smiles on the frowning night, checkering the Eastern clouds with streaks of light and darkness fleckled like a drunkard reels from fourth day's pathway made by Titan's wheels. So night is almost day, 
uh, Romeo and Juliet structured around four movements that all end in dawn. The sky is checkered, it's dark and light, and darkness is getting out of the way of the sun god's chariot, the way a drunk would get out of the way of an oncoming vehicle. Then he's got the couplet that motivates the conclusion, his exit line. He tells us he's going to visit his spiritual advisor, the friar. If you read on, however, to the beginning of the next scene, you will notice something really odd. Those same lines reappear, give or take a few changed words, but they're spoken by a completely different character, Friar Lawrence. And what happened is that Shakespeare uh, first wrote the lines for Romeo, then decided they would be better for Friar Lawrence, but forgot to delete the first set of lines. When his manuscript reached the printer, the printer simply reproduced what was in front of him. So this is very clearly an immediate and localized change of thought. Uh, it, that happens to all of us while we're in the process of writing. Uh, it probably doesn't come into the category of what we might think of as revision. We tend to use revision to mean something holistic, uh, going over an entire script after you thought you'd finished it. But this localized revision is of interest for another reason, uh, something that could actually be the subject of an entire separate webinar, uh, and that is the subject of character. We think of Shakespeare as the poet of identity, the poet of interiority, the poet of character individuality. Uh, I mean, it's impossible really to think of Hamlet's lines being spoken by anybody else. But what we see here is Shakespeare thinking first of lines and then thinking of who might say the lines. It's the demands of the scene that are paramount here. Does this scene need a lyrical conclusion or is it better to give the next one a lyrical beginning? That's the dramatist thinking, not the poet. So that's example one. Let's look at a different example uh, this one's from King Lear. And the scene that I want to look at is the one in which the Earl of Gloucester has his eyes put out by the Earl of Cornwall and Cornwall's wife, Regan. It's a really violent scene, but I'm not going to show any violent pictures or um, violent moments from it. And in the course of this atrocity, uh, a fight breaks out between Cornwall and one of his servants and Cornwall's killed. The scene ends with two other servants commenting on what they've just seen. They're appalled by Cornwall's cruelty and they determine to help the blind Gloucester. They're going to help him medically by binding up his eyes and they're going to help him physically by finding him a guide. And here is the sequence. So Cornwall's bleeding and he asks his wife to get rid of Gloucester. Turn out that eyeless villain, he says at line two. And then he wants to dispose of the dead servant's body because it's really important to tidy your stage. Throw this slave upon the dunghill, he says. Then he realizes how badly wounded he is and he asks for his wife help in exiting. I bleed apace, give me your arm. And we've got the exit stage direction. But two servants stay on stage to comment on what has just happened. And the first says, he'll do anything to prevent Cornwall thriving. I'll never care what wickedness I do if this man come to good. His colleague says, if she dies a natural death, there's no justice. If she live long and in the end meet the old course of death, women will all turn monsters. The other one gets practical. He says, let's get Mad Tom to guide Gloucester. Let's follow the old Earl and get the Bedlam, the madman, to lead him where he would, wherever he wants. Uh, he's very flexible. His roguish madness allows itself to anything. You do that, go thou, the other one says. That's your job. I'll get bandages and ointment. I'll fetch some flax and whites of eggs to apply to his bleeding face. Um, and the medical humanities um, person in me is always really interested in these little medical details in Shakespeare. But in terms of dialogue and its place in the scene, for me, this 
dialogue is a hugely important part of the play. It's a glimpse of a world that has compassion. And the dialogue works for me the way the chorus does in Greek tragedy. Uh, it gives me a bit of breathing space, it gives me a chance to catch my breath after the cruelty that I have just seen. Clear exists in two versions. And the version that we're looking at here is the version that was published in Shakespeare's lifetime in 1608, immediately after the play was written. But the version that was printed in 1623 in the posthumous collection of Shakespeare's works doesn't include this dialogue. And the scene ends like this. Um, Reagan's helping her husband off stage. We've got an exit direction for the two of them. And that's it. From other evidence, we're fairly confident that the manuscript that lies behind the first printed version of Lear, the 1608 version, is Shakespeare's papers. And the copy that lies behind the 1623 folio is what we would now call a prompt book. The Elizabethans didn't have that, that word, but that's what we would recognize it as. It's a version of Shakespeare's manuscript that was marked up for use in the theater. So that means we can see the missing dialogue as a cut that's made in the folio version. Uh, that cut may be made by Shakespeare, uh, or it may be made by the theatre company uh, in performance with Shakespeare's approval. But it's worth our while here thinking about the reasons for that cut. And those are practical theatre reasons. Gloucester's just had his eyes put out, and in production that would involve applying gore to his eyes on stage, uh, fake blood, the stage blood, might even have got squirted over his costume. Gloucester enters nine lines into the next scene with his eyes bandaged. In fact, you can see in the folio, we've got the entrance direction there for Edgar. Uh, Edgar in disguise as Mad Tom the Beggar. Gloucester is going to be brought to him in just a few lines. So the dialogue between the servants at the end of the previous scene in the quarto version is there to give Gloucester time to exit, time for someone to wind a bandage around his eyes in the, in the backstage tiring house, and for him to get into place for entrance early in the next scene. So the compassionate dialogue that I like so much is there not because of its compassion, but because we need time at the end of that scene. We need to extend time. It's um, actually much easier in modern productions to do that transition. It's amazing what you can do with a pair of dark glasses. So why might that dialogue not be necessary in the text printed in the folio? One of the things that happened in 1608 was that Shakespeare's company acquired a new theatre, the Blackfriars Theatre, uh, which was an indoors theatre. Uh, and there's a version of it in the beautiful San Wanamaker Playhouse in Shakespeare's Globe. This indoor theatre was lit by candles. You can see here, 72 candles at the Wanamaker. And that is when Renaissance plays introduced act divisions. Plays became divided into five acts, and there was a short interval at the end of every act while the candles were trimmed or changed. No play in print before 1609 has act divisions. And that short interval, uh, music was played throughout uh, the act interval, and we've got lots of stage directions for post-1609 uh, plays that say music plays throughout the act interval. Uh, and that short interval gives you plenty of time uh, to bandage Gloucester backstage. So the quarto dialogue's initial practical purpose is now redundant and it can be dispensed with. This is practical theater speaking, not poetry. Someone is keeping an eye on the running time of this play. Someone's keeping an eye on the candles. And throughout Shakespeare's text, we often see practical dramaturgy trumping poetry. Hamlet has a missing soliloquy uh, in the folio version of Hamlet. Um, Horatio's long speech in Act One of Hamlet about all the portents in Julius Caesar's, um, um, the night before Julius Caesar's assassination, that gets cut. Desdemona doesn't sing the Willow Song in the quarto version of Othello. And there are practical reasons behind these changes, practical reasons to do with audience attention span, uh, to do with the pace of the play. Uh, act fours of plays often get a lot of cuts. Um, 
practical reasons to do with different actors' musical ability. This one can sing, this one can't. But that's not to say that Shakespeare doesn't sometimes revise like a poet. So for my last example, I want to go to Midsummer Night's Dream. And act five of this play opens with a fabulous speech by Theseus, the Duke of Athens, about the imagination. And Theseus says the lunatic, the lover and the poet are all made of imagination. What they have in common is that they see things. And this is what the speech looks like in the first printed edition. Um, and I've typed it out to make it easier to read. Uh, but let's first unpack what Theseus is saying because it's so important. So in the first three lines, he says, lovers and madmen are very imaginative. They've got boiling brains, seething brains. Then he says that lovers, madmen and poets are very imaginative. <clears throat> and at this time, um, poet was a technical word for dramatist as well as a lyric poet. Uh, when we've got accounts books from Philip Henslow, the theater manager, uh, paying dramatist, he talks about them as poets. So we've got the lunatic, the lover now combined with the, the, the dramatist. It means lyric poet as well, of course. Then Theseus gives examples of how imagination manifests itself in those three different categories. So the madman sees devils. The lover thinks his girlfriend is as beautiful as Helen of Troy, the most beautiful woman in the world. He sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. And um, that's Amore. And the poet is all over the place between heaven and earth. Um, and he embodies what he imagines in writing. He's able to give it substance, a local habitation and a name. So the poet creates a fictional world. Uh, he creates characters. Then Theseus ends with two examples of positive and negative imagination uh, in the last uh, few lines. He says, if you conceive of something joyous, it will happen. So imagination is the power of positive thinking. But simultaneously, if you're really anxious, if you're scared of the dark, you will imagine that a bush is actually a bear. Now I want to think about uh, the poetic meter of this speech because it's a regular iambic pentameter speech, although it is not laid out on the page as such. And we need to work out what was happening in the manuscript beneath the printed text. And that's one of the things that textual critics do for a living. So what I want us to do um, is to mark out the line ends, not where the printer has ended the line, but where the poetry ends the line. So after every sequence of five strong stressed um, syllables. I actually wanted to do this interactively. I was, I was really motivated by Alexei Karanovska's webinar on magnetism last year, uh, but it got a bit laborious. Um, so I've gone for the cookery show model instead, um, and I'm gonna take out of the oven um, something that I made earlier. And that is this slide with the, the red uh, vertical lines. And if you look at the red um, bars, you'll see I've marked the end of each line of iambic pentameter. If you were to read the speech aloud, you would see that it's entirely regular iambic pentameter. There's nothing irregular about its sound, but you can see that it is printed on the page in squashed up metrical lines, two metrical lines to one line of print. This is a printer who knows what iambic pentameter looks like because he gets it right elsewhere in the play. So why doesn't he get it right here? I'm gonna put in bold the lines that are extra long in print, um, the ones that make metrical sense, but they overrun uh, on the page. And you can see that they are linked by one thought and that is the poet. These lines were probably interlined in the manuscript. They were probably Shakespeare's second thoughts. If we take them out, which would be one way to test the hypothesis, this is what the speech looks like. And this is a very straightforward speech about two kinds of people with over imaginative minds. Uh, we've got lovers and we've got madmen, the subject of the opening line. And then we've got an example from each, one, the lover and the other, uh, one, the madman and the other, the lover. But Shakespeare decided to add a third category, the poet. So he put in a line that links all three and he inserts it almost like a second beginning. 
Now he needs a third example of the poet's imagination to balance the first two, and it goes in its logical place after the first two examples. And he really goes to town on the poet. There's much more space devoted to this than to the first two categories. So Shakespeare's writing like Keats here. He's revising for thematic reasons, for reasons to do with his content, but not quite like Keats. He's inserting units rather than changing individual words. Now the critic who first noticed this metrical blip in the 1920s um, thought that these revised lines were added much, much later. And you can see why he thought that because they're actually poetically um, a lot more complex than the lines in the original speech that they are joining. But this suggestion hasn't caught on uh, and it's not one that I would endorse for two very simple reasons. I think this revision takes place pretty quickly. Um, and I've, one of the reasons for thinking that is that the speech has two beginnings. It's got a duplicate beginning. And I think that we might be rather like the Romeo and Juliet example here, that Shakespeare may have intended to delete the first two lines and begin the speech with the lunatic, the lover and the poet. And we've got other examples uh, of Shakespeare uh, having second thoughts immediately and not deleting the first, um, the first lines. But the second reason for thinking that this is immediate revision is that the poet is such an integral part of Midsummer Night's Dream from the beginning. This is a play about imagination and its opposition to reason. And the play explores imagination in three spheres. It looks at imagination in love, in madness and in poetry. It sounds out each in turn. So at the beginning, we're told that Lysander and Demetrius are equally rich equally well derived. So why does Hermia love Lysander? There is no reason at all. Love is irrational. We're also told that Demetrius loved Helena before the play began, but now he fancies Hermia. Why? No reason. Love is irrational. And in fact, Aegeus' accusation, her, the Hermia's father is Aegeus, and his accusation against Lysander is that Lysander imprinted himself on Hermia's imagination. He sent her love tokens, music, poems, the Elizabethan equivalent of Valentine's cards and CDs. So the love plot looks at imagination in love. The central part of the play, The Mayhem in the Woods, explores the dark underworld of the imagination. This is the scary, threatening world of nightmare uh, where couples get the wrong partners and where the fairy queen can love a donkey only to have her rational self reject it when the magic juice is removed. This is a world where a husband can suspect a wife of infidelity. Oberon thinks Titania's interested in Theseus. And she tells him, these are the forgeries of jealousy. Jealousy, in other words, is imagination gone wrong. Uh, he's given a local habitation and a name uh, to jealousy. And remember that all this chaos in the wood takes place by moonlight. This is a lunatic world, quite literally. Uh, a lunatic, etymologically, is someone whose reason is affected by the moon. So the first four acts of the play look at the lunatic and the lover, and now it moves on to the poet. Act five is the play's exploration of imagination in drama. And the thing that always amazes me about Act 5 of Midsummer Night's Dream is that there is no need for it. There is no plot necessity at all for Act 5. The plot's all finished at the end of Act 4. The lovers have been paired up correctly. Um, Theseus overrules Aegeus and says it's okay for Hermia to marry Lysander. In fact, the lovers can all get married at the same time as him. That ought to be the end of the play. Instead, we get Pyramus and Thisbe. Uh, which is a play staged by amateur workmen who totally fail to understand the role of imagination in drama. They think that the audience is so under-imaginative that they won't imagine a wall unless there's an actor physically portraying a wall. But at the same time, they think the audience is so over-imaginative that they will think the lion is real and will frighten the ladies. So what they do is systematically destroy any appeal to the imagination that the play might have. 
They don't understand the transaction that every play makes between audience and performers, which is a transaction based on our use of imagination. And when the mechanicals have been rehearsing in the woods and when they're worried about whether the moon shines the night that they're gonna play, because they're a bit Pyramus and Thisbe meet by moonlight, the audience can hardly fail to reflect that Shakespeare's entire play takes place by moonlight. And he has no difficulty introducing it at all. He does it by poetry. There are actually over 50 references to the moon or moonlight in Midsummer Night's Dream. That's how you bring moonshine into a play. So all of this is to support the point that Theseus's speech at the, st at the start of Act Five is the big manifesto speech for imagination. And it's an area that Shakespeare took great care over. There are 20 misaligned lines at the beginning of this scene. They're in eight passages, not just in the speech that I've shown you. And they're all about the effects of drama. Shakespeare is tightening things up. He's reworking as he writes. Is this the same thing as revision? As I said at the beginning, revision tends to mean wholesale rewriting. We saw Keats changing words in every line. While it's true that several Shakespeare plays exist in two different printed versions with lots of verbal variants. One popular theory is that Shakespeare revised his plays for print, making tiny lexical adjustments. I was quite keen on this theory uh, when it was first proposed uh, in the 80s and 90s. Now I'm less sure. Another theory for which there's more evidence is that plays were revised for performance when they were revived. Uh, the theatre manager, Philip Henslow, who I've mentioned earlier, pays for new endings of plays. And title pages tell us that the clown's role was expanded or other roles were amplified or enlarged. But here you can see that revision is dealing with blocks of text with specific plot lines, specific characters. And that's very different from the Keats model. So in my current work, I'm really interested in the shapes of plays between two versions. I'm interested in different dramaturgies. I'm interested in scenic construction, not minute lexical differences, which can have a host um, of different explanations. Yes, I do think Shakespeare revised his plays, but Shakespeare is a playwright as well as a poet, and the two may function very differently when it comes to revision. This is an absolute hornet's nest in current Shakespeare criticism. Uh, it elicits unbelievable hate mail in the pages of literary journals. People feel very passionate about this subject, very partisan. Um, so I've deliberately chosen today to avoid global theorizing and give you just three small examples of Shakespeare and his company at work. So Romeo and Juliet looking at scene construction, King Lear looking at changing theatrical conditions and Midsummer Night's Dream tightening up thematic content. So I'll leave you with that for now and I will get my screen back, I hope, so that um, I can have dialogue with Diana, Diana that I'm very looking forward to. Thank you very, very much, uh, Laurie. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, can I just say to people, I should have said this at the outset and my apologies for failing to do so, but uh, we've got questions coming in. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screens, you will see that there's a little button marked Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions for Laurie, please uh, click on that button and you'll see a panel comes up uh, into which you can type questions. Uh, so, so I can uh, put them to Laurie as part of our, our, our conversation. Um, I had a couple of questions of my own first. Um, one thing I was wondering was the difference between a play and a poem. Um, I mean, a, a poem like the Eve of St. Agnes is a, is a single definitive text that gets published in an edition that the poet has authorised. But can we ever talk about a play in quite the same way? And you've shown us how uh, in King Lear, when, when the theatre changes, 
the needs of the text change and you get a different version. Um, in Othello, you get an actress who can't sing and so you cut the Willow song. Uh, can you ever talk about a play as having a single definitive text or at least a Shakespeare play as having a single definitive text or is it actually constantly a work in progress, uh, a practical working document? Yeah, that's such a good question. And it's just so relevant because drama is not a static phenomenon. Actually, poetry wasn't in Shakespeare's day either because poets, uh, poems circulated in manuscript. Uh, it, you know, it wasn't really very uh, literary to publish your poems. So there's lots of different versions of John Donne's poems, for instance. But drama has a completely different destination. And drama is a very flexible, mobile, volatile thing. It doesn't stay the same uh, at all. And in fact, one of the images, one of the metaphors that's often used um, to understand how drama works is that a text that gets into print just happens to be a snapshot of the play at that moment in its history. And it bears as much relationship um, to the play a year later or 10 years later as you know, our school photos do to our graduation photos. It's recognizably the same thing in base, but it is under construction all the time. And it can be revised for practical reasons, it can be revised for political reasons, it can be revised for aesthetic reasons. Well, one of the things I remember um, from the Arden Shakespeare back in the uh, sort of late 20th century was that there would seem to be this kind of idea that you were searching for the most authentic text. That's um, exactly right. And yeah. has that gone? Is that no longer something that um, Shakespeare scholars are doing? Exactly. That is that has gone. So there used to be the notion that we were looking for the Shakespeare text. Um, and now we realize that that is uh, a will of the wisp. And there is a phenomenon which is called unediting, where what we're doing is actually separating the text because the Arden editions that you and I studied at school, uh, worked on the assumption that more Shakespeare is better Shakespeare. So they take lines from this version of um, King Lear and lines from this version of King Lear and put them together in one Arden King Lear. And the one thing you can be sure of is that Arden King Lear is a text that Shakespeare certainly didn't write. Mm -hmm. um, so now we've been disaggregating them, um, which is great for publishing houses because it means you have to go and buy the quarto version of King Lear and then the folio version. Yes, I mean, I think that doesn't the, late, the latest album's got two or three different Hamlets in the one Three Hamlet, uh, that's yeah, right, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, so some questions that we've had coming in. Um, one question is, would we think better or worse of Shakespeare if he had not rewritten his texts? And that comes from Stephen Potts. Yeah, isn't that interesting? So Stephen, the answer to that is it really depends what century you're in, whether you would think better or worse of it. I think for, until very recently, there was the, the reverence that felt that um, literary people didn't need to work at their literary work. Um, there's a wonderful book actually by Hannah Sullivan, who's a, a tutor at New College called The Work of Revision. It's about modernist writers and modernist poets. Um, and she looks at what happens uh, when the literary professions become professionalized. And I think for so many years, I mean, centuries, we were reluctant to see Shakespeare as a working man of the theater. And as soon as drama entered our, um, our field of vision uh, in the 80s, Shakespeare, man of the theater was suddenly the title of books and articles everywhere. Um, we started to look at things like collaboration with theater companies that he would make decisions based on actors abilities or he might create characters based on actors um, and that everything was up for grabs so we now like the idea uh, that Shakespeare wrote things more than once. A um, question here from Napoleon Ryan are there original Elizabethan or Jacobean actor Q scripts with variant Shakespearean text still extant? And he says, I dimly remember being told during rehearsals for a production of Hamlet years ago that the actor playing the comparatively small part of Marcellus in one of the earliest original stagings of the play 
had written or released a version of the play where Marcellus's part had been notably enlarged, a sort of early Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the first part of your question um, is really uh, spot on. The Marcellus enlarging his own part is a kind of urban myth. Um, so Elizabethan actors didn't get the whole play. They only got their part. This is pre-photocopier, okay, pre-Wi-Fi printer. Uh, what is odd to us is that they also only got between one and three words of the speech in front of theirs, the one that they were going to reply to. They didn't know who said it. And that's what's called the Q script. Okay, so they get their script and it's got its Q words. So your question, Napoleon, is are there original Elizabethan or Jacobean actor Q scripts? We've got one, Edward Allen's part of Orlando in Orlando Furioso. Uh, we've got a handful from academic drama um, that's plays put on by students at Oxford and Cambridge. Some of them are in Latin. There's a couple in English and there's more uh, on the continent in uh, French and German. Uh, so they do exist. And those, I mean, that's the problem with Pyramus and Thisbe, isn't it? That we're told Thisbe speaks all his part, cues and all. That is the amateur. Um, there's never been a suggestion uh, that's caught on that these parts were instrumental in reconstructing a text that got to the printer. Uh, although there is one oddity, which is in Quarto to Romeo and Juliet, where the nurse's part's in italic. Um, and the suggestion there is that um, there was a problem with the nurse's part in the manuscript that the printer got. So they went to, they somehow got hold of the part to help supplement it. Um, but there was a, for a long time, a notion that actors were reconstructing texts from memory, not from their parts. And Marcellus was the one who was identified for quarter one Hamlet. Um, but um, the jury's out on that currently. Of course, bottom is the prototype of actors who want to play every part and Absolutely. have all the lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, question here from Tony Furnival. To what extent do we, as theatre goers or movie goers, need to have an image of the creative artist as a divinely inspired person rather than a very pragmatic craftsman? You cited wonderful examples of a pragmatic playwright, and I could not help but be reminded of the almost cold-blooded pragmatism of Ralph Vaughan Williams when writing film scores where timing is paramount. Do we have an emotional need for incandescent creativity? Beautifully worded question. Yes, exactly. I think television has helped us get rid of that emotional need if we ever had it. Um, you look at um, the script writers at the end of, you know, Succession or any you know, Netflix series, or you look um, in the cinema uh, as script writers, and you see that this is just a fantastically practical industry. Um, and you know, there are suggestions that the poet in Shakespeare is at odds with the practical dramatist in Shakespeare, uh, which is to say Shakespeare's plays are longer than any of his fellows. He's regularly writing plays that are 3000 lines. And we know that nobody else is writing that long and that doesn't seem to fit um, the running time of an Elizabethan play. So, the question is, what does he do with these superfluous lines? Is he resigned to the fact that they're going to be cut in performance? Because we do have title pages and prefatory epistles of plays by other dramatists that say you're reading more than was said on stage because the actors couldn't fit it in. Or was he always writing with a view that the longer version would be published? And there's no definitive answer to that because it's a very... Um, partisan um, argument. I mean, there's people in both camps very logically. That's one of the reasons why Macbeth's always seemed to me to be such an incredibly satisfying play, because it's so short and tight. The complete text can be performed. I mean, people sometimes cut a bit of the Hecate scene or whatever, but, but basically you can perform the whole text and, and it's done in two and a half hours. Yeah, we, we like that a lot. So, but the question is, is that our 20th and 21st century uh, aesthetic or attention spans. 
because Shakespeare's comedies are shorter than his histories and his histories are shorter than his tragedies. And Macbeth is a complete outlier. I mean, it's just longer than Comedy of Errors, which is the shorter play. For a long time, people were saying, oh, it's because Shakespeare's got his finger on the pulse of the new monarch. You know, James I famously didn't like long plays. <laughs> now the current thinking is that Middleton, who added the Hecate scenes, also cut material in it. Um, but it's a really interesting example, as you say, of something that works aesthetically. The concentrated nature of that, the fear, the suspicion, the tightness of that, um, is just wonderful. Um, and so there can be really good payoffs for things that start with um, a different origin. I've got a question here from Svenja Helmo, the current JCR president. Hello, Svenja. Uh, is uh, Romeo and Julia, Juliet's bad quarto so obviously not Shakespeare that it is beneath consideration? Actually, Romeo and Juliet's bad quarto is one of the better bad quartos. <laughs> Uh, and there is quite a considerable support at the moment for the view that that could be um, a version, I mean, a legitimate version. Uh, and the problem with the term bad is it's so qualitative. And what we should really be saying is, you know, it's the short version. It's certainly now well documented that Henry Chettle had a hand in one scene. Um, so once you see that, it opens the door to seeing goodness elsewhere in that quarto. And the problem is with comparative thinking that bad quartos always seem bad in association with the version that we have become so familiar with and that we are so in love with. So the so-called bad quarto of Hamlet was never discovered until 1823. And Hamlet's famous to be or not to be soliloquy has as its first line to be or not to be, I, there's the point. That line never stood a chance because we'd already had 200 years of that is the question. Um, so I think it's very hard for us to unlearn our attachments. Um, that's fascinating. I'm just wondering if I, there's the point might actually be a better line. I don't know. Well, actors will defend it <laughs> in, in yeah. indeed, yeah. <laughs> um, here's a, a question from Dave Morris. I'm curious as to whether there's any work in deep learning analysis of lexical patterns in Shakespeare that would highlight outliers in the text. Can you tell us first, what is deep learning analysis of lexical patterns? Okay, well, the answer, the simple answer to your question is yes, and it's a huge industry. Uh, and I own loads of books for which I need degrees in statistics and mathematics to follow the ins and outs of all that argument. Uh, but there are very gifted, talented people who are indeed uh, working, working on those things. So all kinds of uh, lexical tests that you can run on plays where you're looking at um, patterns of choices of words that are beyond the conscious choice of an author, mm -hmm. like contractions, for instance. So those are not things, um, you know, whether I um, say in it or whether I say I n apostrophe t, those are things I might do, but that's not a choice in the way that I'm working out a metaphor, and it's also not something that's subject to imitation. So this is this has been one of the biggest uh, developments in the last um, two decades or three three decades, particularly. And this this tends to lead to, to plays being reattributed. Is that right? And, and discovering uh, of collaboration. Exactly, exactly, and bits of plays being reattributed. Um, and that links with the earlier question about would we think less of Shakespeare, you know, because it's a, there's a, 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 a group who think that somehow you're sullying the Shakespeare play. Um, I mean, I'm interested in the kind of organic unity of the literary construction within the play, which can be quite separate from the unity of the hands that contribute to that. Do you sometimes, though, secretly finding a, a bit disappointing if, if some of your favourite bits turn out not to be by Shakespeare? Um, it's only because we have elevated the Shakespeare industry uh, in the and created the Shakespeare industry so that, you know, he is the paradigm of 
Renaissance writing. Are there any of your favourite bits that turn out not to be by Shakespeare? Um, I have spent a long time, decades ago, lecturing on how wonderful the opening of Henry VI is, that, you know, here is Shakespeare, you know, with this exquisite sense of how to construct a scene right at the start of his career. Um, and now there's such good evidence that's by Thomas Nash. It's still a great opening scene. Yeah, yeah. It's, at least it's not the Earl of Oxford, right? Quite. Um, <laughs> Um, so this is a question from Penny. Uh, Hiya, Laurie. Are there any lines in any of the plays that Shakespeare left in, but you would have edited out? Well, that's really interesting, Penny, because when I was looking at that lunatic lover and the poet speech um, for talking to you this evening, I was really astonished that editors do not cut out lovers and madmen have such seething brains. Because mm. if I were an actor trying to deal with that, I would be saying, why does he say this? Why does Theseus say this? And then say that. They do not work together. And so the first one I think would have to go. And the fact that it's never been edited out, I think shows how wedded we still are to the kind of more Shakespeare is better Shakespeare notion. Of course, it may get edited out more in performance. Yeah, and actors, I have learned more from sitting in on rehearsals, talking to actors, watching directors at work uh, than I have from Shakespeare books. I have because read. actors will turn around and go, I can't say that. They've got to make, they've got to make it work. Yeah. They just ask really practical questions. I, 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 I remember- Academics, I should say, are now catching up with actors. You know, theater is big business <laughs> in Shakespeare's studies. The, the worst experience I had of this um, was when I was in a, a production of Macbeth. In fact, while I was at Oxford, uh, it was an out production that we took around Kenya. And um, the man who is now my husband, but who was not then my husband, uh, cast me as Malcolm, which I regarded as a personal affront. <laughs> but um, Malcolm has an appalling line. When, when he's told, your royal father's murdered, mm. he replies, oh, by whom? Yeah. I, I, I could not find any way to say that line that was remotely convincing. Oh, by whom? Uh, yes, it's up there on a par with Lady Macbeth's what in our house when she's just yes, in our house. Thing, you know, like, oh dear, I've got to show But at least that has the benefit that she is in fact faking. Yes, quite, so yeah. May, so she, she may just not be faking very well, but Malcolm's royal father is genuinely murdered. And <laughs> it's, a, it's a quite strange response. Um, Here's a question from David. Thank you so much. You mentioned the change in Lear, which addressed the change in theatre practice. Have you or anyone else engaged in a thorough examination of the differences between the quarto and folio versions in terms of stagecraft? It seems very sensible that a theatre practitioner would change things that either didn't work or got in the way. I mean, I, I guess the example that you gave us is, is such an example, but are, are there other examples that can be seen in, in, in Lear? Yeah, so one of the scenes that we all love um, is the, the trial scene, uh, the joint school, stool scene, when Lear in the hovel with Mad Tom sees, has stools and pretends that they are, th or thinks that they are Goneril and Regan and sets up a trial mm -hmm. and that is cut. And that's a really interesting example of just, you know, it's fantastic psychological insight but it's at a moment where it creates longer um, in the play uh, and you just need to keep it moving. I mean, a similar example actually is Horatio's speech um, when he's got this whole long speech about all the portents before Julius Caesar died. And then the next thing that happens is the ghost comes on stage. And it is quite clear that pre Steven Spielberg, pre CGI, what you don't want is the audience losing attention on Horatio and then watching an actor walk across the stage as a ghost. You want suddenly to look at a ghost and think, oh my goodness, where did he come from? Mm. Um, so you cut the speech, uh, mm. lest it um, distract. I was wondering about, about the, the Lear example. Um, I mean, you, you, you made the very good point that that exchange between the servants gives you a feeling of a world in which there is compassion. And I wonder if there's, there might be an artistic reason for cutting it as well as a stagecraft reason, which is 
that it, having that speech not there increases the extraordinary bleakness of, of Lear. And maybe that's what Shakespeare wanted with that play. Well, quite. I mean, that's just a wonderful observation. And you're you're right on the on the page with other Shakespeare critics there who say that it is very clear that the cumulative effect of the cuts, the cumulative effect in the folio text of the cuts in the quarto text, give you a world that has no hope, no compassion, no theology, nothing. Then it's very easy to say that is the reason for the cuts. And that's what I think um, is more problematic for critics to know what is cause and what is effect. Yeah. But he, because he must have been aware of the effect, though. yeah, and Shakespeare aware. was um, because he's a sharer in his company. Normally, uh, dramatists have got no control over their manuscript once it's sold to the company. But because mm. Shakespeare's a sharer, he does have control, and one assumes that any change they made had his approval. It's interesting, particularly because you'd think that that might not play so well with audiences. I mean, we we know, of course, that, that later that. King Lear had a happy ending uh, yeah. tacked on because it was so unbearable. Yeah. And, and wonder, the I mean, King Lear, his source had, yes, a, happy had a happy ending. So, so, so what he does is, is gratuitous. And yeah. you wonder what, what, what's, what's going on there? It, okay, it's... that is the one Shakespeare play I cannot read in a single sitting. It is just too much. You know, when King Lear says in the Heath, pour on, I will endure. I think that's the experience of the reader with that play. Like this is too much. So I need a break in that one. Um, and there's lots of you know biographical readings that this is the moment when Shakespeare was having a nervous breakdown because you're right that the, the world vision in that play is seriously, seriously depressing. Um, okay. Question from Jane Sarrell. What about theories that others added to texts, such as that Emilia Bassano added the extra uh, first folio lines by Emilia in Othello? <laughs> um, this is a niche question. Yeah. You'll have, you have to explain it for us. Okay, so Emilia Bassano, the dark lady of the sonnets, probably. Um, that's a nice fictional thing. And I've seen some very good plays and read short stories about Emilia Bassano's involvement and the, the, the feeling that there's a school of thought that she might have been Shakespeare's lover. Um, what is very interesting, though, is that the current thinking based on comparison of Q, Q Othello and the Folio Othello um, is that the folio came from Shakespeare's script, manuscript, and the quarto represents the acting version. So the, the folio is the longer version written by Shakespeare, and your suggestion is that Shakespeare wrote it with help from Amelia Bassano. It's a lovely idea, no evidence, I'm sorry, but it would make a great play. And a uh, final question. Um, in fact, there, there are two questions which I guess uh, both go together. One is, is there an example of Shakespeare revising or cutting text to avoid censorship? And the second question is, is it right that Falstaff was originally uh, Old Castle? Um, yeah, and the answer to both of those is yes. Yeah, Shakespeare, I mean, one of the things that's really interesting about censorship is it's the external political legal force that most closely collaborates with the creative imagination. So it's not quite as simple as I wrote this, the censor cut it out, I had to rewrite it. Because you kind of know when you might be on the edge. Um, and that's not to say that we don't have plays that are heavily censored. So Sir Edmund Tilney censors the manuscript of Sir Thomas More. And he says, you know, leave out the insurrection, the opening scene wholly uh, and begin with. And he's basically saying, cut out everything that is dramatic about this. <laughs> um, Falstaff was originally called Old Castle, yes. And it wasn't the censor that overruled that one, uh, but it seems to be the Cobham family um, who were descendants of the original Old Castle. Um, and they objected to the kind of scurrilous 
uh, representation in the Henry IV plays of their ancestor, who, who was a Lollard uh, martyr. A Lollard martyr actually was a modern connection, in fact. Um, and we still have the pun in Merry Wives, where Falstaff is referred to as my old lord, old lord of the castle. Uh, old lad of the castle, uh, punning on his name, even though he's not called Old Castle anymore. And presumably the, he can't have been called full stuff when Mary Wives was written, because that's written after Henry IV. Uh, that's right. So, in, it, yeah, so it well, must be just an in-joke to, to get a, a, a laugh from the audience who, who well, knows. The that genesis has been of the Mary Wives text is interesting, but that is the logical logical deduction, yes. And we've got that in joke also in the epilogue to Henry IV part two, where um, the epilogue says, if you like the story, um, our author's going to continue it, make you merry with uh, Catherine of France, uh, and you'll see more of false stuff. Um, 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 and that's not Old Castle because Old Castle died a martyr and this is not the man. You know, <laughs> saying, we know this is Old Castle, but we just can't say it's Old Castle. So it's, it's a bit like um, the elaborate apologies that you sometimes get on satirical programmes when they've yes. been forced to apologise. That's exactly right, yes. Well, I suppose that the, the tub of lard standing in um, yeah. for, for the politician on um, not the um, yeah. news quiz. So um, that's uh, been absolutely fascinating. Uh, th thank you so much, Laurie. Um, I think we're going to have to uh, call it a night there. Um, we could have gone on for a significantly longer period of time. Um, I think th this way into the uh, Shakespeare, seeing him as a working dramatist uh, is so uh, enriching and, and fascinating for us. And the final thing I wanted to say is listening to you has made me even more just long to be back in a live theatre. Uh, yes, you and me both. <laughs> the modern well, player is the first opportunity we get. Yeah. Yeah, back in the President's Garden. So yeah. th thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And um, our thanks to Laurie for an absolutely fascinating evening. Thank you very, very much. And we hope to see you all soon. Bye bye. Thank you.